Hi, I can't be with you today in class, so uh, I've left a video for you to uh, look at. Um, you can uh, see this video, it's posted on the YouTube channel, there'll be a link from the Moodle page. And, uh, uh, and you might want to take some notes along the way. Today we're going to talk about orbital maneuvers. We're going to talk about how to use rocket engines to change our orbits in various ways. We'll do that today and again on Thursday. So, um, uh, let's begin. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to, to review what we know about orbits. Uh, and let's, let's, uh, let's uh, um, first of all, uh, talk about energy. Energy is um, a fundamental concept, and the specific energy of an orbit is a really, really useful quantity. And of course, it's the sum of the specific kinetic energy, which is just one-half V squared, and the specific potential energy, which is minus gm over r, where m is the mass of the planet that your satellite is moving around, and r is your distance from the center. Okay, so um, uh, orbits come in different types, as we know. There are bound orbits. You have uh, circular orbits and elliptical orbits. And the, uh, the speed in a circular orbit is the circular orbit speed, which we saw some weeks ago. In the um, in the elliptical orbit, you can't say exactly what the speed is. All you know is that it's less than the escape speed. And for each of these orbits, the specific energy is less than zero. And that's because um, zero is enough energy for your potential energy to be, to be zero. That's, a, that's enough energy to be found at a very great distance from the planet. The eccentricity of a circular orbit is zero eccentricity of an elliptical orbit is something between 0 and 1, less than 1 in any case. And eccentricity, of course, is a measure of, of how elongated the ellipse is. Then there are unbound orbits. The unbound orbits include parabolic orbits and hyperbolic orbits. A parabolic orbit is the a type of orbit you have if your speed is just exactly equal to the escape speed. Your total energy, kinetic plus potential, is just zero. And that um, is just barely enough energy to escape to a very great distance away from the planet. The eccentricity of a parabolic orbit is, is uh, one. And then there are hyperbolic orbits. That's where your, your, your speed is actually bigger than the escape speed. And the, uh, the, the total energy is positive. And that means that your eccentricity is even bigger than 1. So let's talk about um, uh, elliptical orbits. The elliptical orbit shape is characterized by two numbers. The semi-major axis, which is half of the, of the long axis of the ellipse, and the eccentricity, which is a measure of how flattened the ellipse is, as we said. And so um, those two numbers are also related to two other numbers, which are the, the, um, uh, the paracenter distance and the apocenter distance. So the paracenter distance is just 1 minus the eccentricity times the semi-major axis, and the apocenter distance is just 1 plus the eccentricity um, uh, times the semi-major axis. The sum of those two is just 2 times a, and that means that you can calculate the eccentricity by taking 1 minus the ratio of the paracenter distance to the semi-major axis. Now, um, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, there are a number of, of, uh, of uh, uh, relations between the shape of the ellipse and various dynamical quantities like, like uh, uh, speed and time and energy and so on. So let me go through those. The first one is that most useful relation, the relation between the semi-major axis and the specific energy of the satellite in orbit. And uh, uh, that means that the, the specific energy is just minus gm for the planet divided by 2 times a, a being the semi-major axis. Or turning it around, a is equal to minus gm over 2 times epsilon, the specific energy. And this is just a tremendously useful relation. We use it all the time. The second relation comes from Kepler's second law, and that just says that the distance at paracenter times the uh, speed at paracenter is equal to the distance at apocenter times the speed at apocenter. And finally, there's Kepler's third law, the relation between the size of the orbit and the orbital period. 
And it says that the semi-major axis cubed is gm over 4 pi squared times the orbital period squared. We also have parabolic orbits. In the parabolic orbit, of course, the, the energy is just equal to zero. And that means that the speed anywhere on the orbit, the speed's just equal to the escape speed at that point, because the escape speed is the speed you have to be going so that your specific energy is zero. And uh, parabolic orbits all have eccentricity equal to one. They're all very simple. And finally, there are hyperbolic orbits. Now, hyperbolic orbits are pretty interesting. So they all have energy greater than zero, and that means that at a very great distance, at, at infinitely far away, if you will, from the planet, you have some speed, which is called the asymptotic speed. And that asymptotic speed is such that, that the specific kinetic energy, way far away from the planet, is just equal to the total energy. So, so that, that epsilon of, for the, for the um, specific energy is just equal to one half times the square of the asymptotic speed. Now, <clears throat> um, uh, the eccentricity of a hyperbola can't be defined in exactly the same way as uh, the eccentricity for an ellipse because there is no semi-major axis. The semi-major axis, if you will, is infinite. However, we can find a, a, a formula for the eccentricity that does work for both ellipses and, um, and hyperbolas, and that relates the eccentricity to the energy. But the, the neatest form is just to, to note that the eccentricity of a hyperbola is just 1 plus the distance at paracenter times the square of the asymptotic speed all over gm for the planet. And you can see that that will be a number that's bigger than 1. For a parabola, of course, the asymptotic speed is 0, and so the eccentricity is 0. Now, the, per, the hyperbolic orbit bends the path of the, um, of, the, uh, of the orbit. And so it bends it through an angle that we call beta, the, the bending angle of the, uh, uh, of the hyperbolic orbit. And that bending angle is related to the, um, is related to the, the, uh, the eccentricity of the hyperbola by the fact that the sine of half the bending angle is 1 over the eccentricity. All right, so now we're going to talk about orbital maneuvers. We're going to talk about how to, how to use rocket thrust to change our orbit, and we'll find out how much, um, how much uh, fuel we'll need to make uh, certain kinds of, of changes. Uh, and, um, and, and so let's uh, talk about some simplifying assumptions that we're going to make in our study of, of this, this problem. So the first simplifying assumption is, is this. We're going to... to um, uh, uh, assume that all of the orbits that we're talking about uh, are in a single two-dimensional plane. We're not going to be ch discussing plane change maneuvers um, where, where, and that, that's it's complicated but perfectly analyzable. We're going to assume that all of the orbits that we're going to talk about are in one plane. The second thing is, is a very important assumption. We're going to assume that all of the velocity changes are impulsive. That is to say they're sudden. They happen effectively instantaneously. What we're really assuming is that the time over which our rocket thrust is applied is very short compared to um, the period of the orbit and things like this. As uh, that, that comparatively speaking, um, the changes due to rocket thrust are sudden compared to the changes due to gravitational pull of the planet. Um, and and uh, that's a pretty good assumption for chemical rocket motors and, uh, and a nuclear rocket motor, that's not that good an assumption for an ion thruster, as we said. Uh, ion thrusters um, uh, are very efficient, they have very high uh, specific impulse, but they have very low thrust. So typically what you do is you fire an ion uh, engine for, for days or weeks or months to affect a large orbit change, and, uh, and, and so our analysis will, will just not apply to those situations. What this assumption means is that our trajectory, the trajectory of our spacecraft, is a set of free, a series of free orbits connected by sudden velocity changes due to the application of rocket thrust. It's a, it's a, um, a series of conic section orbits. All right, 
Another um, assumption that we're going to usually make is we're usually going to um, we're usually going to assume that our application of rocket thrust changes the speed, but not the direction in which we're traveling. That is to say, we're either going to fire to increase our speed or fire our rocket motors to decrease our speed. Um, and that's a, that's a, 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 includes a lot of really interesting cases, so that's going to be an assumption we will, we will usually make. Now, in the end, uh, we're going to want to say something about, about uh, uh, delta V. We're going to want to change, find out how much we've changed our speed, because the amount by which we've changed our speed will be related to... Um, how much fuel we use by means of Tsiolkovsky's equation, which relates, relates that change in, in, in speed, that delta V, to the mass ratio of the, in, the initial and final masses of the rocket vehicle. So that's going to be just the number we need in order to figure out the, the requirements uh, in our spacecraft for making certain orbit changes. All right, so let's, uh, let's uh, talk about how we make a maneuver. Let's suppose we're in an orbit. We're orbiting around um, a, a planet, and then at some point, we fire our rocket motors and we shift to another orbit. Uh, then, um, uh, uh, what's going on here? Well, how, how does that, how does that um, um, change things? Well, this change in, in orbit is sudden, which means that if you have a, a distance from the center of the planet r and v before the orbit change, then after the orbit change, your, your distance and speed are r and v prime. It's the same r. Notice that because the change in velocity is assumed to have occurred suddenly, that you are essentially in the same place in space, same point in space, before and after the maneuver. Your position doesn't change instantly. Your velocity changes instantly. And that means when we calculate energies, the potential energy before and after will be exactly the same, minus gm over r for the, sp for the spacecraft at distance r from the center of the planet. But the, the kinetic energy, um, which is 1 half v squared, won't be the same. So, so our, our orbital maneuvers will change the kinetic energy, but in that moment when they happen, the potential energy stays the same. So, uh, so let's talk about a, 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 very nice, uh, a very nice example problem. Um, the problem of escaping from a parking orbit. So suppose we want to send a spacecraft out into deep space. Then very often the way we arrange our, uh, our, our, our mission is to first go into a parking orbit, say around the Earth, uh, perhaps a low uh, parking orbit a few hundred kilometers up, and uh, in a nice circular orbit. And then we fire our rocket motors and we shift to an escape orbit, an orbit that leaves the Earth entirely. So before we're in a circular orbit, after we're in an escape orbit. Now the easiest situation to think about is the situation where we just barely escape. We go from a circular orbit to a parabolic orbit. The minimum uh, uh, amount of fuel we need to escape from the planet. And so our, um, our uh, initial velocity is just the circular orbit speed. And our final speed is just the escape speed, which is the square root of 2 times the circular orbit speed at a given distance. So this is really easy. This means that the, um, that the, uh, the change in speed that we, we have to accomplish with our rocket motors is just the square root of 2 minus 1 times the, um, uh, uh, times the, the, uh, the circular orbit speed, uh, which, is, which is about 0.414 times the circular orbit speed. So this is a, a nice, uh, a nice easy relationship. So let's uh, let's think about a, a, a real example. Let's imagine we're uh, we're escaping from uh, Earth orbit, and uh, uh, because we remember the Earth, g times m for the Earth is about four times ten to the fourteenth meters cubed per kilo per uh, second squared, and um, uh, and let's suppose that we start out with a circular orbit, a parking orbit that's uh, that's got a um, that's got a radius of about seven thousand kilometers, seven times ten to the sixth meters. Well then the, uh, the, the circular orbit speed is about, uh, is about um, uh, uh, 7,560 um, meters per second. And so the, uh, the delta V in order to go from that circular orbit into a parabolic escape orbit is, is just 
0.414 times that, which is about 3,130 uh, uh, meters per second. Okay, that's good. But but let's uh, let's th let's try to think about a um, uh, a a more complicated example. I mean, we might not want to just go into a to a barely escaping orbit. Let's imagine we want to go to uh, a, a faster escape orbit, a hyperbolic orbit. So so in this situation, um, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to uh, um, start out in a in a uh, uh, circular orbit, same radius, seven thousand. Um, uh, 7,000 meters per second, and, uh, and, and, but then we want to go into an escape orbit such that our asymptotic speed, our speed through space very far away from the Earth, is not zero as it would be for the, uh, for the parabolic orbit, but 2,000 kilometers or 2,000 meters per second. Um, so we're in a hyperbolic orbit. And the question is, what kind of delta V do we need for that? Now you might think that what you need is you just need to add um, 2,000 uh, meters per second more to the delta V that we had before. Let's see if that's true. Okay, so um, uh, uh, how, do we, how do we analyze this? Well, the way we analyze it is actually by thinking about energy. Energy is our, is our, our key to all of these problems. So before, there's a certain um, kinetic energy. Uh, Specific, we're all talking about specific energies all together here. Um, the, the specific kinetic energy is one half v squared. We can calculate that. It's the circular uh, orbit speed. And there's a certain um, uh, there's a certain uh, potential energy minus g m over r. And um, and there's a certain total energy which is uh, which is kinetic plus potential. And of course we know because this is a bound orbit the the total specific energy will be negative. What about afterward? Well, afterward, we have a potential energy which is exactly the same as the potential energy was before we made the maneuver because the change in speed is impulsive. We haven't really gone anywhere while we fired our motors. We, we're still at the same point in space, so our potential energy is still minus gm over r. It's the same as before. The new energy, however, is going to be higher. The, and, and the total energy for, for the particular, um, the particular uh, hyperbolic escape orbit that we're considering is just going to be one-half times the square of the asymptotic speed. So we can calculate that directly. And then when we want to calculate the, uh, the new um, kinetic energy, we can just take the new total energy and subtract off the new potential energy, which is the same as the old potential energy. Once you have the kinetic energy, that tells you your new speed. It's just the square root of 2 times the kinetic energy. And once you know the new speed, you know what the old speed was, you know what the new speed is, you can take the difference, and you can find out what delta V is. Notice it's the absolute value of the difference that always matters, because you have to fire your rocket motors, you have to use fuel, if you will, whether you're speeding up or slowing down. So okay, here we go. We've got everything we need. Let's um, let's uh, let's see if we can uh, let's see if we can we can analyze uh, what's going on. We have uh, we have an initial parking orbit, which is a circular orbit of radius seven thousand kilometers. We have um, we want to go into a, a hyperbolic orbit with an asymptotic speed two thousand meters per second. All right. So let's uh, let's consider um, uh, some characteristics of the initial orbit. First, we consider the potential energy. And that's just minus gm over r. We work that out. It's about minus 5.72 times 10 to the seventh joules per kilogram. Remember, that's the unit of, um, of specific energy. Uh, it's the same as a meter squared per second squared. And of course, that potential energy, which is negative, of course, is also going to be the potential energy after we fire our rocket motors. And then there's the, there's the, um, the, the kinetic energy. Uh, specific kinetic energy, which is just going to be 2.86 times 10 to the 7th joules per kilogram. Notice that for circular orbits, the kinetic energy is positive and just half as big as the potential energy. And that's always true. That's always true the, for circular orbits. Um, the kinetic energy is just one half of the negative of the potential energy. And then, therefore, the total energy, when I add them together, the total energy is negative, but it's just equal to the negative of the kinetic energy. 
um, minus 2.86 times 10 to the seventh joules per kilogram. All right, so those are all the energies for the initial parking orbit. What about our hyperbolic orbit? Well, for our hyperbolic orbit, the new kinetic energy, um, oh, well, sorry, the new total energy, we know that because we know that it has to be one half times the square of the asymptotic speed. So the asymptotic speed is 2,000 meters per second. So the, we know that the new total energy has to be 2 times 10 to the sixth uh, joules per kilogram. The new, uh, the new kinetic energy is just the new total energy minus the new potential energy, which is the same as the old potential energy. And when I add those up, remembering the signs, because when I subtract off the potential energy, I'm actually adding something because the potential energy is negative, then I get 5.92 times 10 to the seventh joules per kilogram. So that's the, that's the new kinetic energy immediately after I fire my rocket motor. So what kind of speed does that give me? Well, that uh, calculating the new speed immediately after I fire my rocket motors um, uh, tells me that I'm, I'm moving at about uh, uh, 10.88 kilometers per second. And so my delta V has got to be 3,320 meters per second. 3,320 meters per second. That's the delta V I need to shift from my parking orbit to my escape orbit. I want you to, uh, to, to note that you can also calculate um, several other things about, about this new orbit. For example, you can calculate the, the eccentricity because you know that that point at which you jump onto the hyperbolic orbit is the paracenter distance. And you know the asymptotic um, speed of the hyperbolic orbit. And so that means that the eccentricity, 1 plus uh, RP V infinity squared over GM, that's going to be for this orbit about 1.07, uh, and so uh, you can calculate all kinds of things from that. Notice something curious. When we had a parabolic escape orbit, the, um, uh, uh, the, the, um, the speed we need to go to, the speed we need to achieve, is just exactly equal to the escape speed. The total energy of the new orbit is just zero. And, and our, our asymptotic speed is zero. And so we calculated what we needed for that, and we found that it was, that it was uh, 3,130 meters per second. But compare that to a hyperbolic escape speed. There, we, we need to get, go faster. We need to have an asymptotic speed 2,000 meters per second. And we thought maybe it was true that the, um, that the, uh, uh, that the, we needed to add, therefore, 2,000 meters per second to our speed. But it's not true. The delta V we needed for this is only 3,320 meters per second. It's just 190 meters per second faster. So by adding 200 meters per second, a little less, to our maneuver, we actually get a final speed 2,000 meters per second higher. It's not quite as simple as it seems because what we're really talking about is changing the energies rather than changing the speeds. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how we should analyze orbital maneuvers, just in general. Any kind of orbital maneuver we can sort of approach in a particular way. The, the first thing to notice is that we need to calculate the change in the energy going from epsilon to epsilon prime for this orbit change. Because we know all about our initial orbit, and we, all, we know all about the orbit that we want to go to, we can figure out in each case what epsilon needs to be. And so we'll know what change in the energy we need to make. Now, during the orbital maneuver, the gravitational potential energy, specific potential energy, of course, doesn't change at all because that it happens suddenly. We haven't moved anywhere. And so any energy change that we make has to be an energy change in the kinetic energy. And so, and so we know how much we have to change the kinetic energy to achieve the energy change that we've already calculated we need for the, uh, the change in orbit. Now, of course, if we know how the kinetic energy is changing, we can figure out the old and new speeds uh, using the fact that the uh, speed is just the square root of 2 times the specific kinetic energy. 
And once we have the old speed and the new speed, then we can calculate the delta V. And of course, delta V is positive even if we're slowing down. It's whether we're speeding up or slowing down, we still need to change our velocity. That still is going to require the, um, the application of rocket thrust. That's still going to require us to consume some fuel. Okay, so let's uh, consider a couple of uh, kinds of, of uh, orbital maneuvers that we can, now, we can now analyze with the ideas that we've talked about here. The first kind is uh, what you might call just orbit insertion. So this, you might imagine a spacecraft um, approaching another planet, spacecraft approaching Mars. And if, uh, if you didn't fire your rocket motors, the spacecraft would just zoom by Mars in a flyby trajectory, a hyperbolic orbit, uh, like we analyzed in class last week. But what we do is when we reach our point of closest approach, we fire our rocket motors, and then that slows the spacecraft down into uh, an orbit, a closed orbit around, the, uh, around the, the, the spacecraft. And so we can figure out how much we have to reduce the energy, therefore how much we have to reduce the kinetic energy, therefore what kind of delta V is required for this um, orbital insertion maneuver, and figure out how much fuel would be required to enter orbit around the planet. Or here's another example, and that's the example of changing orbits. We just imagine we have a satellite in orbit around the Earth. Um, and then we want to change to a different orbit. Perhaps we want to change to an orbit that has a different, um, a different perigee. Maybe our perigee is too low. Maybe our perigee would be passing through the atmosphere or something. And so we need to fire our rocket motors. So we do. We fire our rocket motors. We, we change the energy of our orbit. Therefore, we change its semi-major axis. Um, and we can calculate now, by the techniques that we've considered, how, we can, uh, how much uh, delta V is required uh, in order to... Um, in order to accomplish a particular orbit change that we want. And in either of these cases, once you have delta V, you can apply Tsiolkovsky's equation to figure out um, uh, uh, the fuel requirements for, uh, for making a particular orbital maneuver. So we can escape from a parking orbit, we can enter orbit, we can change our orbits. And, uh, and of course, um, uh, next time, we're going to learn how to, do, to combine a couple of, of orbit changes to, uh, to do a very interesting kind of orbit, a maneuver called the Hohmann transfer. But before we get to the Hohmann transfer, let's, uh, let's uh, practice a little bit uh, um, by, uh, by thinking about a particular problem where we change orbits around the Earth. And this is a real world problem. This is based on a, 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 an orbit change maneuver that, that was actually done uh, back in the 1960s. <coughs> The, uh, uh, the, 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 the particular spacecraft we're talking about is Gemini 11, the next to last of the Gemini series that, um, that was the two, uh, the, the two manned um, U.S. Uh, um, spacecraft that was uh, leading up to Project Apollo. And in 1966, Gemini 11, uh, the spacecraft docked with the, uh, the Agena target vehicle, which was sort of an upper stage booster that, was, uh, that had been placed in orbit separately. They docked together, and then the astronauts used the rocket motor on the, uh, on the, the uh, Gemini, uh, on the Agena vehicle to change their orbit a lot, to boost themselves into a higher orbit. So initially, the orbit um, uh, was a, um, uh, the orbit was a, was a circular orbit, with, uh, with an altitude of about 300 kilometers. Of course, that's the altitude. So in order to find the radius of the orbit, we need to, uh, we need to, to add to it the radius of the Earth. So the uh, radius of the Earth is about 6,370 kilometers. So the radius of the orbit initially is a circular orbit of radius 6,670 kilometers. And then um, uh, we, we fire the rocket motors and increase our speed a bit and boost to, a, to an elliptical orbit. And now, in the elliptical orbit, the perigee is the same as before. We're, we're at the perigee point when we fire our motors. Um, it's a 300-kilometer uh, um, altitude, or 6,670 kilometers uh, from the center of the Earth. But the apogee altitude, the distance of the, of the Gemini 11 spacecraft um, uh, from, the, uh, from the surface of the Earth is 1,400 kilometers. So you've, you've boosted yourself um, more than 1,000 kilometers higher at the high point of your orbit. 
This was indeed at the time, um, a, uh, a, if you will, the, the world altitude record, which uh, wasn't broken for a couple of years until astronauts headed for the moon. Okay, so now you know everything you need to know to answer a couple of questions. The first question is, what delta V is required in order to make this maneuver? How much delta V did Gemini 11 have to achieve in order to raise itself from a circular orbit, which is, of course, the apogee and perigee were all the same, to one whose apogee was more than 1,000 kilometers higher? And just to give you a, a workout on, uh, on material from our, our, our chapters on rocket propulsion, Tsiolkovsky's equation and so on, let me give you a little bit more and let you, uh, and let you work on that. Um, that is that the Agena uh, a rocket motor, if you look it up, you find out that the Agena rocket motor had a specific impulse of 300 seconds, from which, of course, you can calculate the exhaust speed of the Agena. And so, um, uh, and if you, you look at the combined masses of the, of the, uh, of the Gemini spacecraft, about 3,800 kilograms, and the Agena target vehicle, about 3,200 kilograms. You look at their combined masses, the total is about 7,000 kilograms before the orbital maneuver. So now you should be able to find out how many kilograms of fuel Gemini 11 had to, uh, had to employ in order to make this orbital change um, in, their, in their orbit. It's a, a nice problem. So what I want you to do is I want you to, to, uh, uh, to work with your with your tutor uh, in class today and try to collectively work out what the answer to this question is. Um, this is uh, uh, a little bit brief. Um, uh, we'll, uh, we'll put the slides from this, uh, from this um, lecture up on, um, up on the Moodle page uh, and, um, and you can refer to them. Uh, and I want you to, uh, I want you to try to, to figure out the, um, uh, the answer to the question. First, how much delta V is required for the Gemini 11 orbit change? And second, um, uh, given the delta V, how much fuel did Gemini 11 have to use from the Agena uh, booster vehicle uh, in, order to, in order to achieve this orbit? That's, uh, that's what I want you to take a look at. And so, um, uh, uh, work it out, and, uh, and, <coughs> and your tutor knows the answer already, so he'll help you out. Uh, okay, that's it for today. Um, we'll come back again on Thursday. Thursday, you'll be hearing about the Holman transfer, and uh, uh, that's where you want to go from one circular orbit to another circular orbit. That's going to require you to make two orbital change maneuvers, and, uh, and so that's a, that's a very interesting problem, and it'll be, uh, it'll be extremely useful in dis discussing how you can um, maneuver around uh, the solar system using uh, rocket thrust. So, have a great uh, afternoon. We'll see you uh, uh, when I get back.